As I mentioned, welcome to the Understanding Employer Benefits Workshop um, hosted by the Albert Spaceman Center alongside um, our subject matter expert from Aon. Um, and before I turn it over to Mike, I will um, just go over a few housekeeping items. Just a reminder for everyone that this is being recorded today as it will be extremely helpful for us to revisit in the future when it is applicable. Um, and so we will be recording today. We will also be sharing the presentation after. So we will be sharing the slides. There's gonna be a lot of good, helpful content in there. Um, and then please feel free to ask questions throughout. So feel free to drop them in the chat, either to myself, to everyone, um, to Justin or Mary Lou, um, and they can ask the question on your behalf. Uh, Mike has encouraged us to ask questions throughout. And then we will also have some time in the end to get to questions as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we are very lucky to have a subject matter expert with us here today to touch on employer benefits. Um, Mike Rask has been with Aon for, I, thought, I think it was over 30 years um, as the senior VP. So we are lucky to have him here today. And without further ado, Mike, I will turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Abby, and thanks everybody for being on the call today, especially on a beautiful day in Seattle. So I uh, appreciate you uh, spending the next hour or, or so uh, chatting about employee benefits. And this is a rite of passage for everybody who graduates from college and goes into the workforce of this nebulous world of benefits that often were provided uh, by your parents up until this point, and now you'll be making those decisions on your own. The interesting thing about benefits is they don't get a lot of attention from individuals until you need them. It's, it's similar to going to the Apple store and looking to possibly buy an Apple watch, and then you walk around town, and what do you notice? Everybody around you has an Apple watch on. You never noticed it before until uh, it had relevance. And similar, similarly with employee benefits, uh, you really take notice when it's time to use them, whether it's medical, whether it's dental, whether it's life or, or disability. So if you could please go to the next slide, please, Abby. Thank you. Um, about Aon and who I work for, we are one of the globe, global leaders in risk, retirement, and health consulting. We have 50,000 employees in 120 countries. And as you can see, there's some big numbers associated with the work we do with employers around the world. And we're just getting ready to merge with another company with 50,000 employees. So we're going to be an even bigger deal in, in helping employers look through the ways to manage their risk, their retirement, and their health. So Abby, next slide. Where I'm going to focus today is on the blue Squares. I'm going to focus on the health and welfare programs. You'll see the red square there of retirement. What I will say about retirement is if you are offered a retiree benefit or a retirement benefit program, most likely it's either going to be a 401k, if you're working for a for-profit employer, or a 403b, which is for non not-for-profit employers. My recommendation is participate, participate early and as much as you can. You are all very smart college students and you know that the people who succeed in life are the ones who understand compounding interest. So if you start early and put as much as you can possibly put into your retirement programs and take, in many cases, take advantage of the free money that is given by your employer with matching contributions, you'll be way ahead of the rest of, of the individuals. So that is my shameless plug for retirement programs. They are there for you. Make the most of them. Uh, they, the dollars come out on a pre-tax basis. They actually help your taxable wages. And you're, if there's anything you should learn in life, it's to pay yourself first. So uh, contribute to the retirement programs and make the most of them. Other, from there, we're going to look at what are called health and welfare programs. These are all the programs associated with health and with disability. And so I'm gonna take you through a high level 
uh, overview of what these programs are and how, how they are interactive. You'll see legislation and laws. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. I do have a couple slides at the end, but just know this. When I first came out of college, I thought that companies like Aetna and Cigna and Travelers and Blue Cross, I thought it was the old adage, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat you know, a path to your door to buy your products and services. What I learned later is everything that we're going to talk about today is predicated on legislation and laws that, that drive how these programs are structured, how they are taxed, and how they are sold uh, to the public. So I, I will have a couple of slides on that at the end. Abby, if you can go to the next one. Perfect, so we're gonna start with health plans and then go from there. So we can go one more. So as you come out of school, you'll go to work for an employer. And in many cases, they will offer you a health plan. There are some traditional health plans which are starting to age out. And there are new health programs which are very much on the rise. The ones in green are more of the traditional health plans. And our industry has more acronyms than you will ever see uh, anywhere else. PPO, POS, HMO, EPO, all of these different acronyms. Let me tell you that the ones in green, the main one that you will see today, or the main two are preferred provider organizations. And in essence, think about going to Costco. You have a Costco card, you go to a Costco store, you get a deeper discount. If you have a PPO card and you go to a preferred provider, a physician or hospital, you get a deeper discount. That's in essence what that is all about. If you don't go to one of the preferred, preferred providers, it is a, a higher expense and, and more dollars out of pocket. We still do have health maintenance organizations. Think of Kaiser is our primary one in our state. And those are designed to um, put all of the healthcare pieces in under one roof where they are owned and managed by the organization. So it is more brick and mortar. They own the physicians, they own the hospitals, and they manage healthcare that way. We're gonna dig deeper into flexible spending accounts a little later as a way, as a tax savings for you, for the dollars that you spend. So I'm not gonna spend time there. And then you'll see in blue, we have something called consumer directed health plans. And there are two types of these programs, but similar to a lot of the managed care programs, the health reimbursement accounts, the HRAs are starting to fade out over time. And the main one we're seeing are health savings accounts. And we'll talk a little bit more in, in depth on those here shortly. Abby? So if we put these on a continuum, you'll see to the far left, there's far less employee responsibility with, an, with a health maintenance organization. In essence, you have your, your card, you go to one of their facilities, you work with one of their physicians, and they manage your health very, very effectively, and often with very, very low out-of-pocket expenses when you go for services. All the way at the other end, the program that, we, that I mentioned was health savings accounts. These are where we're giving you, your, your employer will give you much more control over the dollars you spend. So there's more out-of-pocket expense, but there's also more opportunity for you to save dollars on a pre-tax basis that you can use for healthcare expenses and other expenses in the long term. Because there's more responsibility with you in terms of how you spend those dollars, we're seeing a lot of new players in the market that are putting opportunities for you to be able to shop just like when you shop for any other uh, consumer good. You're going to be able to look at physicians and hospitals to see how effective they are in the care they deliver and also the price for their services. Because like any, like any product, there is a huge variance in service. And what you're looking for is high outcomes in terms of, of the type of care. 
at a low cost. That's, that's the key issue that, that you will have at your fingertips in order to be able to make decisions about. Okay, Abby. In terms of um, how are these programs priced, again, the least expensive in terms of pricing, especially premiums, are going to be with the HSA accounts, health savings accounts, and at the other end, the PPOs and the indemnity programs. Okay, Abby. I wanted just to show you briefly how charges are shared between the plan and you as a participant. There's some words on here that you may have heard of or you may not have heard of, and you'll learn more about them as you get into working with your employer and having your own health plan. But, but first and foremost, there's something called a deductible. And this, this is a first dollar expense for the participant. And there is also a cap, as you can see in the first line, for a family. So it's usually three times the family. Um, but for a single person, if you went in for a physician visit and it was $500, you would pay the first $200. And then after that, that remaining $300 would be subject to, again, another term, coinsurance. And this is how the, the plan and you share in the expenses once you get past the deductible. So in this scenario, with coinsurance, the plan would pay 80% and you would pay 20%. So if you had $300 remaining, what is that? That's $60. 20% is $60, and the remaining $240 would be paid by the plan. So for this, for that office visit of $500, you would pay $240, and the plan would cover the rest. From there, from there we have something called an out-of-pocket maximum. So health plans today now have unlimited coverage. Think of any other product you buy that has unlimited coverage. Just up until a few years ago, it was a million dollars was the maximum that you could have during your lifetime. Then it went to two, and then it went to three, and then it went to unlimited. And so with that in mind, there's, there is a maximum amount you'll pay out of pocket versus what the plan will pay out of pocket on an annual basis. And in this scenario, it's $1,000. The other thing you'll hear or see sometimes are co-pays. So yes, you have your annual deductible. Let's say you've already satisfied it, but you're out on the weekend, you twist your ankle very poorly, and you head to the emergency room, there's gonna be a copay associated with that visit. And usually we, we're seeing much larger copays now than $50. We're seeing them at 100, 200, even $500 because the folks are wanting you to go to urgent care or someplace else. Now, they're not going to penalize you for a life-saving emergency, or if you're admitted to the hospital, they'll waive that copay. What they're trying to do is not have individuals use the emergency room as their primary place of receiving services because it is so expensive. Okay, Abby. Prescription drugs. So this has become a major part of healthcare today. What I can tell you about prescription drugs is that in 1997, they, they allowed pharmacy companies to advertise to the public for the very first time. Previous to 1997, if, if we had asked you to name some drugs, you would have said Bayer, Anison, and NyQuil. That's about all you would have been able to know. But if you watch TV ever in your life, you're bound to see a pharmacy commercial, if not once, twice, or three times an hour. And the reason that they do this is because people buy. And I'll use the example, there was, there was a drug a few years ago and we figured out that for this particular drug, 
they spent $160 million in advertising in one year. That's just one drug, $160 million. The return on investment, $2.8 million, $2.8 billion. So now instead of going to the physician and saying, I have a cough, what would you, could you prescribe something? Individuals now walk in and say, I want this drug in this prescription and, and in this form. So the consumers are now driving very much of the pharmacy spend. Where the pharmacy spend used to be one out of $10 in healthcare, it's now one out of every $4. And in certain industries, one out of every $3 that is spent by the employer. We have different types of drugs that you can see here. There are brand name drugs. These are drugs that are under patent and uh, the pharmaceutical company has the ability to charge uh, the amount that they see fit for that, for that dollar or for that, for that prescription. When they go out of patent, then they become generic and multiple generics show up based on the chemical components of that drug and the cost drops dramatically. The average price of a brand name is a, a brand name drug is around $90. The average price for a generic with the same chemical components could be as low as $8. There are what are called formularies. You may hear about a formulary within your employer, and that's where the employer has worked with their, um, their prescription drug manager or with their health plan to identify drugs that have the same efficacies but have lower costs. So they're trying to uh, make the most of the drugs that, that do deliver the, the right results, but they do it at a much lower expense. The other thing that's showing up is a word called specialty pharmacy. In the past, pharma pharmaceuticals were primarily designed to be high volume, low cost, what we have today are specialty drugs that are extremely low volume. They're very targeted for a specific condition or issue and have extreme costs. We have some drugs now that cost as much as 300, 500, or a million dollars, 300,000, 500,000, or a million dollars for a dose or, or a treatment plan. So that's, that's, again, another thing that an employer is battling in terms of trying to keep their health plan affordable. You'll see below are the copays that often uh, are related to a pharmacy program that you would be uh, required to pay. And they're broken by generic, brand formulary, and then brand non-formulary in this scenario. And then if it is a, a recurring drug, if it's a long-term drug that you are taking, you're able to order it via mail order and, re and receive a bit of a savings by doing that. So uh, that's something to keep in mind as whether your, your employer will have a mail order program. Okay, Abby. Carve out programs with your health plan. What we see uh, for employers is often they are not keeping everything under one roof with Aetna or Cigna or Blue Cross but they're carving some of the different pieces out. And you'll see some terms here, behavioral health, employee assistance plans, and disease management and wellness. And I'm gonna go into those here briefly. Okay, go ahead. So the first is mental health. Uh, there was something called the Mental Health Parity Act in 2008. Uh, before that, uh, a lot of these um, services were capped on the, the annual amount that that an individual could receive from the health plan either in a year or in a lifetime, but now they must be treated uh, very, very similarly uh, to all other medical and surgical benefits. So that is, that is a very positive thing for, for individuals. Uh, em employers often uh, recognize that, that there are other issues that, that employees are challenged with and need support on. So they have developed employee assistance programs. 
And these are designed to go beyond mental health. They go into financial counseling. They go into elder care. They often have legal services in terms of establishing a will, uh, as well as support for the family, uh, whether it's counseling or the like. Uh, it is completely confidential. It is uh, the employer only receives reports that say how many people use the program for what types of services, but nothing ties back to a specific individual. These are fantastic programs if, if you or a family member is in need of any of these issues. Okay, Abby. Wellness. Wellness is a, a key area as well as disease management. So let's put it in perspective. For, for an employer, we used to use something called the 80-20 rule that 80% of the expenses came from 20% of the employees. We, I now call it the half percent or 1% rule, that a half a percent or 1% of the population is often driving 60 to 70% of the employer's expenses. So employers are doubling down on two things. One, helping people stay well, because there are multiple effects of wellness, not only from physical health, but emotional health, and also um, uh, helping individuals be more productive in their work environment. But the other piece of it is an employee under age 30 without any health conditions costs the employer about $1,400 a year. An employee over age 50, 20 years later in three health conditions, cost the employer north of $14,000 a year. So the dollars invested in wellness to keep people well, as well as disease management to help individuals navigate the, either their chronic or acute issues will help the health, the, the health plan stay affordable as well as keep the premiums low for the entire group. So that's where, why the employer often will put these programs into place and for those individuals that do have existing health conditions, they often have reach outs to those individuals to help them make sure that they're navigating the health, health program most effectively. Okay, Abby. Dental. So dental programs, uh, really there's, there's three types of dental programs. There is indemnity dental programs, which is a reimbursement program. There's some with PPOs and HMOs like we saw in healthcare. And uh, especially with the dental HMOs, they work more off of a, a schedule where you go in for a filling, we're gonna pay you $25. If you go in for uh, a bridge, we're gonna pay you $1,500, $1,500 of the expense and you'd be responsible for the rest. So those are unique programs, but if Ab Abby, you go to the next slide. This is what uh, the dental programs usually look like. You have what are called preventive care services. These are your, your cleanings. Usually the program will pay 100% uh, for two cleanings a year so that you get in and stay healthy. We were talking about wellness in the, in the health pro program. Wellness in dental truly is impactful and has a direct impact on, on an individual's teeth and keeping uh, good dental care. Basic and restorative care is a filling or, or, or the like. And then the major restorative care are your crowns and bridges and onlays, the larger, uh, more expensive cares uh, comes, comes into play there. Orthodontia is usually paid up to a small amount during an individual's lifetime. And like, like the health plan, it has a deductible and it has an annual limit that, that is covered by the program. Okay, Abby. Vision. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the two most important benefits and what I believe is the least important benefit. The two most important benefits made available to you are your health program, and your long-term disability program. Those are the two most important in my mind, taking retirement out of the mix, just talking 
about the health and welfare programs. And I'll talk more about disability and why it is so important. Naturally, having a health plan with an unlimited amount of coverage available uh, speaks for itself. But the lowest and least important benefit is vision. Um, just from, from a cost standpoint, uh, yes, it's nice to have an eye exam. Yes, it is ha uh, it's nice to have um, lenses and frames covered. Uh, but, but in the big picture, it, it, it just isn't the most important and wouldn't be the reason to choose one employer over another is if they had vision or not. I have glasses that, yes, vision is important to me, but as a benefit, um, when, when you look at the dollars, it, it, it usually does not pan out. Okay, Abby. Um, okay, pre-tax accounts. We'll move to the next one here. There are a, a number of pre-tax accounts that your employer may make available to you. The two at the top are called flexible spending accounts. One is for health care and one is for dependent care, either for a child or an elderly or an elderly uh, elderly child or or a parent. So these these programs oh, actually no, it's just the children. Sorry, not the parents. Yep. Um, these programs are designed for you to take advantage of uh, reducing your spend from a tax standpoint. So in essence, if you're in a 30% tax bracket, you're able to spend 70 cents on the dollar for your healthcare expenses or 70% of the dollar for dependent care expenses. Uh, they're fantastic programs. I'll go over um, the challenge with them in a moment. Additionally, you'll, you'll also have com com potentially commuter reimbursement accounts for transit and parking that become available. If you could go to the next slide, please, Abby. For your healthcare, you can see here, it pays for uncovered or unreimbursed medical expenses. So we talked about deductibles, we talked about coinsurance, we talked about out-of-pocket expenses. You would be able to fund these through a healthcare spending account. So you'd set aside an amount out of your paycheck Let's say you set aside $100 a month. That means you would have um, $1,200 for the year to use for uncovered expenses. The cool thing about the healthcare expenses is, let's say your health plan starts in January and you choose to do uh, $100 a month, you have access to that full $1,200 January 1st. So you can use that, those dollars immediately to cover out-of-pocket expenses from your health program. Uh, oh, there it is, dependent care, child or elder care. So um, you have the ability here to pay for those expenses. Again, these are existing expenses. Uh, so it's just a way to save the taxes on dollars that you spend already. Different than the health care, the dependent care account, you can't withdraw funds until they're actually in the account. So you'd have to wait till the end of January, the end of February, the end of March, to use those dollars. Okay, Abby. Now the big thing with flexible spending accounts that you just need to be aware of, it shouldn't be a deterrent, is if you don't use the dollars in those accounts by the end of the year, they're forfeited. And they're forfeited back to the employer. And the reason they're forfeited back to the employer, it's not that they want those dollars, it just has to do with the tax laws and how we get to the tax savings is you actually give those dollars back to the employer and then they give them back to you when you incur an expense. But if you don't use them, they stay with the employer. <clears throat> Additionally, the, the accounts can't be commingled. So if you had $2,000 in your dependent care account and $1,000 in your healthcare account, you used up all your healthcare dollars and then had some additional healthcare expenses, you wouldn't be able to draw those from the dependent care account. They are separate silos and you cannot commingle the accounts. Uh, the nice thing is at the end of the plan year, you still have up to 90 days to be able to submit expenses and to get them reimbursed. Okay, Abby. Disability plans. We have three different types here. We have short-term, long-term and supplemental. 
and we'll go to the next one, please. So disability, as I had said earlier, is the most important benefit after healthcare. And why it's so important is you are actually ensuring your ability to earn an income, <clears throat> which is your, your most important asset. So with that, there are two types of disability programs. One is short-term and the other is long-term. And if you go to the next slide, please, Abby. So with short-term, it's designed to provide coverage for a predetermined finite period of time, usually 60, 90, or 180 days. It covers non-related injuries and illnesses. Work-related injuries would be covered by workers' comp or workers' compensation. And <clears throat> your employer may or may not require a contribution. Some, some employers pay for these benefits, Others make them available on a, on a voluntary basis. Usually there's a waiting period before, before benefits start. So we talked in medical about a, a, a dollar deductible that you pay up front. In disability, it's a time deductible. So if you have an illness, there's a five day deductible before the plan starts to pay or with an injury, it starts right away. <clears throat> Employers may require you to use your sick leave before you can access the benefits. And often it will coordinate with workers' comp and FMLA. All right, Abby, we can go to the next slide. So we saw that usually the short-term disability pays for 60, 90, or 180 days. Well, lo and behold, the long-term disability starts at 90 or 180 days. So often we'll see employers dovetail these two plans together so that when the short-term disability ends, if it is a long-term disability, that that plan will start to pay. <clears throat> the long-term disability, uh, that 90-day that or 180-day waiting period, again, is the, the time deductible before the plan pays. And usually it will pay 60%, that's the most common we see today, is it will pay 60% of your income and up to a period of your social security normal retirement age. So if you are on long-term disability, it is going to pay uh, up, up past age 65 for everybody on this call and upwards to age 67. So I'll use a real world example. Um, one of my closest college friends, uh, this was three years ago. He's the best water skier I've ever seen. When I ski with him, all I see is his taillights all day long because he's out skiing me all day. He's a fantastic um, soccer player in, in the peak of health and went to a soccer tournament up in Canada and had a stroke at age 55. He is not able to work and he is now on disability, but he is going to earn an income from age 55 to age 67 because this plan is in place. So think about the importance of the salary replacement for that period of time for, for what a good, good period of time here of 12 years and continuing to earn an income. So that's the importance of it. I would also tell you, I won't have the percentage exact, but usually you are 10 times more likely to become disabled during your working career than you are to die. So that's the importance of disability. Okay. All right, next slide, please, Abby. Some employers will allow you to uh, purchase supplemental coverage where you could increase the uh, income replacement from 60% up to 66.6% or up to 75%. Some of them might have a, a lower maximum that doesn't cover all of your salary. So you'd be able to bump up that maximum so it would cover all of your salary. Uh, both of those are available on a voluntary basis if your employer 
makes them available. Okay, Abby. FMLA, you may have heard of this term. It's the Family and Medical Leave Act. This is designed to allow an individual to take a step away from work to take care of a serious medical concern, either for themselves, a family member, a newborn child, uh, and or the like. It allows, uh, it is available for employers who work more than 1,200 hours a year. And uh, the nice thing about FMLA is it maintains that individual's ability to return to work uh, when the FMLA period is over. So this is there and available. Uh, it can be provided without pay or with pay. It'll be based on what that, um, that employer chooses to do and how they structure it. Okay, Abby. Okay, survivor benefits. So uh, we can go to the next page. These are designed uh, to support uh, beneficiaries. Uh, the, this is when the employee passes. Uh, the most common type of coverage that is made available by the employer is group term life. So it doesn't have any cash value. You're buying, it's like your, your house insurance or your car insurance. It covers, covers you for a sp specific period of time, but you've paid those premiums. And at the end of that period of time, uh, there is no additional benefit. So um, the employer often pays benefits as a flat dollar amount. 50, 100, $150,000, or they might provide it as a multiple of salary and say that they'll cover the first one times your salary or two times your salary. Uh, the premiums are paid either, either by the employer or by the employee or on a, uh, a mixed basis. They might, might, you might share in the cost of those premiums. And also know that uh, above 50,000, it does become taxable income to, to the participant if there's a dollar amount above 50,000, but it's, very, it's a very small amount. Okay, Abby. Accidental death and dismemberment. Yes, it sounds as gory as it is. So this is designed really, if you were to die in an accident, not only would you receive your life insurance, but you'd, you'd, provide, you'd be provided double uh, the, the amount of life insurance because it was due to an accidental death. The dismemberment place uh, part of it comes up uh, when you have, um, you have a, a, a permanent injury and then there is a whole schedule pages long of, of the different ways that the dismemberment side of this would pay. So it could be fingers, it could be toes, it could be foot, it could be eyes. Uh, and there is a reimbursement uh, schedule associated with that. So uh, this, this is an important benefit for your beneficiaries. Um, it, it provides an additional amount of, of payment to them in, in the event of your passing. Um, and it is a, uh, significantly less expensive than life insurance because um, like we said with disability, 10 times more likely than a life insurance and a death by accidental, an accidental death is far less than, than dying uh, from other conditions. Okay, Abby. Again, here are the supplemental coverages. You can buy this for life or what is called AD&D. Uh, it's paid by the employee. Uh, you wanna pay for it with after-tax dollars. So if you're given a choice between after-tax or before-tax, Think about this with any of the benefits that you're looking at. If you pay before tax, that means you save monies on the premiums, but the benefit when it goes to be paid to you, then that has to be taxed. The, the government's gonna get their taxes one way or another. So uh, as a general rule, it's better to pay taxes on the premium and get a better settlement on the backside without tax if, if possible. And if the dollar amounts are significant that you're going to purchase in life insurance, there could be evidence of insurability. It might be a form, and in some, some instances, even a blood draw. So just, just keep that in mind. Okay, Abby. 
Many employers provide something called business travel accident insurance or, or BTA. This is designed to cover an employee, uh, to cover you while you're traveling on business. It doesn't mean commuting to and from work. This means you're getting on a flight and going to LA for a client meeting or going to DC for a conference or things of that nature. It is generally paid for by the employer and uh, is, is seen as a, a very, very important benefit. I'll tell a, uh, a sad story, if I, if I may. Um, Aon, uh, many of you would not know, was the third highest casualty on, um, on September 11th. Uh, we had the 95th to the 105th uh, floors of the South Tower. Now, one of the things we did, there was a bombing in the South Tower years before that, and we changed our AD and D policy. We changed that policy to say, if you were killed at your desk from a terrorist attack, that it would pay. And so um, it ended up paying a very, very significant amount uh, for those individuals who, who perished on 9-11. So where it would have usually been a work expense uh, because you were at work, we made it so that, that it actually paid uh, for those individuals. And we had individuals who had started that day. They hadn't even qualified for benefits. They had a 30-day waiting period, but we still paid out all of the benefits, which, which was uh, very, very helpful for those families. So thank you for letting me tell that brief story. Okay, Abby. Uh, uh, okay, voluntary benefits. We're seeing more and more programs being made available for participants uh, to provide more choice, to provide more options, uh, to purchase the types of care and coverage that you would, you would like to do. A lot of folks like to pay by payroll deduction. So if you could payroll deduct for your, your homeowner's insurance, for your auto insurance, for other types of coverage, all of these things become available. Um, some, some individuals like to purchase for critical illness. Uh, also, another big piece is long-term care, the ability to, to cover uh, if and when you may need to be in a nursing home. So all of these types of programs are available. They're done by payroll deduction. You do them after tax so that the benefits are not taxed when they're paid. And they're also portable. You can take them with you. So if you leave that employer, you can continue these, these benefits uh, through direct payment. Okay. And then last, uh, fun, funding contributions. So here, if you go to the next slide, please. Just thought you might like to see, you know, how and where the cost sharing usually works between the employer and the employee. So you can see to the left, the employer usually covers the basic life and accidental death and dismemberment. <clears throat> they often cover the short-term disability and the core long-term disability. In the middle are the ones where the premiums are shared. That's the medical, the dental, and the vision. <clears throat> and then to the far right are the ones that are usually paid in full by the employee. There's a choice. These are the voluntary programs. These are the reimbursement accounts and some of the other supplemental coverages. So the ones to the far, far left are the ones that the employer covers. To the far right are the ones that, that you as an employee would pay for, okay? And then the employer, based on their size, may choose to hire an insurance company, like we mentioned earlier, the Aetna, the Cigna's, the Blue Crosses. Or if they're big enough, they may say, you know what, we're going to pay for this ourselves. We're gonna we think we can manage it more effectively, and we think we can be uh, more cost effective uh, than doing it all through an insurance company. So your employer may be fully insured or they may be self-insured for any and all of these. Usually the medical, the dental, the vision, and short-term disability, as you can see, are self-funded self 
the long-term disability and the life insurance generally is not. But, but the medical dental is where they really can be much more effective in their management of the programs. Okay, Abby. So I'll take you through just a couple of the legislative pieces here real quick. <clears throat> Benefits started way back in the 1800s. They became much more important after World War II. As our veterans returned and as the economy started to become robust, employers started to start offering benefits as a way to recruit and retain top talent. And that has continued since then. And if you keep going, Abby, it's uh, gone it's, it's gone a long way since there. And if you go to the next one, please. One more. Thank you. So you'll see that uh, along the way that the government has gotten involved with these benefits to make sure that they are structured effectively, uh, that they are fair and equitable, and that they meet the needs of a changing population. So there are all these different laws and rules that come into place as it relates to how these benefits are managed, how they're paid for, how they're taxed and the like. And um, any of these would be uh, a seminar in, unto itself. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here if I may, Abby. And if you wanna just take down the presentation, we'll see if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Mike. That was, that was very, very helpful. Um, students, if you have any questions, you can, or participants, um, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, or if you would prefer, you can drop your questions in the chat and we can ask them on your behalf. Um, does anybody, does anybody have any questions? Can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> All right. Um, Thank you so much for the explanation of these. When we are choosing benefits, I know we're often given many different choices. Are there just like three things that are always you want to look for, or if they are offered, always, always, always pick? Um, or is it really just situational and what's best for us? So if, if let's, let's take a, uh... Let's, let's approach it from this manner. You may, you may get into a health plan and they'll have multiple choices for you to look at. For you, there, there's usually two ways to think about it. Do I, wanna, do I wanna pay less out of my pocket in premiums and pay more when I go for services? And if an individual is, uh, doesn't have any health conditions, usually doesn't use healthcare very much, that, that would be a good, a good way to go. If you have existing uh, health conditions, you have a number of um, uh, prescriptions that you take or other types of conditions, then it might make more sense to bump up to a richer health plan and amortize those costs with higher premiums, but pay less when you go, when you go for services. Um, for for individuals without any health conditions, taking advantage of a health savings account can be fantastic because the employer will fund dollars and you can fund dollars into them, which will be there for long-term expenses over time. Plus it reduces your taxable income. If you were on at the beginning, if there's a retirement program available, take advantage of it, uh, participate and do the maximum amount that is allowable and do that for as long as you can. Uh, I'm a firm believer, this is my own philosophy, this is not Aeon's, this is Mike's, but if you can take the monies out of your, out of your paycheck before you, they get, you know, you, before you get it and get them off to investments or, or other types of pieces, it, it makes things easier for you. And, uh, and again, especially with the retirement program, uh, take advantage of it and also get a financial advisor earlier in life than I did. So. Um, that, that can be very, very helpful as well. Mm -hmm. And if, if they do have disability available and it is voluntary, still get it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Mike, you mentioned- um, we're waiting. 
Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. I was just going to ask no, a quick ahead. question. Um, you you mentioned that the two most important things are, or the two most important benefits are um, health and and disability. Do you know, like just off the top of your head, what percentage of companies provide short-term and long-term disability? Is it a requirement? Will students be seeing this a lot as they receive offers or is it few and far between? I would say you'll see much more long-term disability than short-term disability. Uh, and you will see there's a strong prevalence, especially as you move up with larger employers. Some of your smaller employers may choose not to offer it or only offer it on a voluntary basis. Okay. The other comment I was going to make is right now you are at a very interesting apex in healthcare. It is uh, in the 1800s, we had the gold rush. In the 1900s, we had uh, the oil rush. In the early 2000s, we had the tech boom. And right now, we are in the healthcare boom. So a few years ago, just less than five, there were maybe 200 healthcare apps. We're north of probably 50,000 healthcare apps now. Um, Everybody wants a piece of the healthcare dollar. And we're seeing technology come into play on multiple fronts, not so much to solve healthcare issues, but to position themselves for an exit strategy and to be purchased. There are some great companies out there that are doing fantastic things. And employers right now are really struggling in how to separate the wheat from the chaff as it relates to which of these companies are going to be here for the long term and truly are going to make an impact on cost. But the cool things are being able to do a doctor's visit from home, uh, not having to be able to do telehealth, uh, to be able to do uh, so many other things in healthcare that we couldn't do before. Uh, it's, it's really an exciting time, but it's also, uh, it's a challenging time to figure out how and what is going to be the long-term solutions versus the fads that, that fade away. Any last minute questions before we wrap up this afternoon? Mike, thank you so much. This was extremely helpful. I personally have a full sheet of notes. Um, as I mentioned, I will be sharing out this uh, PowerPoint presentation with those of you that attended today, um, because there's a lot of helpful information and graphics on there that I know that I would probably want to revisit. Um, Mike, thank you so much, and uh, we hope we hope we can work with you again in the future because this was super helpful. Absolutely, thanks everybody. And if you are graduating soon, all the best to you, and uh, uh, wishing you every success in your careers. So take care. Thank you.